I'm just going to do a bit of housekeeping here and then I'll leave to Sandra and Rosa the floor. So what I welcome first to this first episode of our Tabula Valley Historia Moderna because we actually usually in our previous life we usually meeting around a novel table. Um, but we are obviously going to be online for, uh, for the next few months at least. Um, but the first reminder is to turn off the cameras for uh, all the, not the speakers, but all the microphones, because we're actually going to record, uh, we're going to try to record the free papers uh, at least, or at least an hour, bet. And nothing, I'm just going to share, or not even share, you can find in the chat the program of the uh, Early Modern Roundtable for the next three episodes. And I just leave the floor to Sandra and Rosa. This is going to be quite an extra large version of our uh, round table usually with just one speaker so um, rosa or sandra i don't know who is going to be in charge of the first section yeah thank you very much and um to everyone uh, who's attending this workshop uh, welcome on behalf of uh, rosa and myself um, so, uh, as you've already seen in the program, this little workshop is uh, structured in two parts. So first we'll have a session with three individual papers with a Q&A at the end, then a little break, and then the second half will be a roundtable. Um, there's been a very small change in the order of the papers of the first uh, session, namely that the papers by uh, Luca and Joanne have been uh, switched. Other than that, they're all, three, uh, all three of them are there. Um, and I will also already immediately say that we'll uh, take questions for the three papers after the third paper um, by, uh, you can either raise your hand using the raise hand function or write in the comment section that you have a question. If you prefer, you can also just write your entire question in the comment section if you want me to read out your question for you. And I'm saying this now already so that in case people uh, would like to, you know, indicate that they have a question while the speakers are still speaking, they feel free to already do that while they are speaking. Um, so without uh, further ado, I'll, let me introduce to you our first speaker, who is uh, Rachel Medura, who is currently an assistant professor of early modern European and digital history at Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. Uh, Rachel's most recent article um, entitled Itinerating Europe, Early Modern Spatial Networks in Printed Itineraries 1545-1700 has appeared this summer in the Journal of Social History. And she's currently at work on her first book on early modern surveillance, espionage and the origins of Europe's postal system. And uh, today she is going to give to us a paper entitled uh, Conductrix et Administratrix uh, Tassis Post Mistressships Across the German and Swiss Passes. So the floor is your, yours, Rachel. Thank you, Sandra. And actually, if I could get your confirmation once this is sharing correctly, I would appreciate it. As we've said, we somewhat hide our um, participant view. So let me try doing just the tab. Um, there we go. Okay, does that look okay? Yeah, works perfectly. Excellent, thank you. Okay, and let me, since we're a little tight on time, I'm going to set my own stopwatch as well. All right, so I'd like to begin by thanking the participants and organizers today um, uh, and say good morning from Virginia where I am based. Um, I'm looking forward to what seem like some fascinating presentations and a, certainly a very distinguished group for the following round table. Uh, to provide some context, um, the talk that I'll be giving today does relate to my first book project, which was itself my um, Stanford University dissertation. Um, currently, the working title for that project is uh, Postal Intelligence, the Tassis Family and Communications Revolution in Early Modern Europe. Um, this represents some material which does appear in that, but I've always had trouble fitting in in its entirety. So I am somewhat thinking through what this might look like as a freestanding article as well. So my thought for today is that I will provide some general background, especially on the Tassas family, uh, and then talk about three postmistresses of a special note. Um, the, the first of whom I've spent the most time on and who is familiar to Luca from uh, a panel series we did way back when. So to begin with the background, um, the Tassas family of postmasters and postmistresses um, originate from a hamlet known as Camerata Cornello, which is located just north of Bergamo. Um, and in fact, it looks very similar to the image we see of the Tassas family here as kind of a, uh, of Tassas family housing, um, as kind of a medieval Chita Alta, which is now actually a museum dedicated to the family and postal history. 
Uh, this was a key strategic position, um, especially by the 16th century, when it was located on the border of Spanish Lombardy, the Venetian land empire, and the Swiss Valtel Valtellina region to the north. The Tassas are among a number of families who translate this geopolitical location into really a pan-European reputation for brokerage um, and, in, and hospitality as well. So many of them are known as innkeepers in the following centuries. Uh, specifically, the valley that Camarón de Cornello is located in, um, the Val Bremana, is of special importance. And in fact, those families from that one valley uh, dominate membership of the early Venetian company of couriers, uh, to the extent that it's often referred to as the company of the Bergamaschi. There are many different modes of mail carrying in late medieval Europe, including rather famously um, the Italian Scarsale, uh, however, the notion of a postal system is based on uh, the establishment of postal way stations. And these are locations where riders can pick up and distribute mail, they can spend the night, or they can alternatively ride and relay to achieve the fastest possible speeds. Uh, this had existed in antiquity, but is brought back into the Renaissance world by the Visconti and Sforza Dukes of Milan. Uh, it's later picked up by the Venetian Company of Couriers. So these are our first two major uh, Renaissance postal systems. The Tassas are one among a number of families that are involved uh, in these systems, uh, but they hitch their horses, so to speak, to the Habsburg dynasty rather early on, and this gives them a key competitive advantage. In the image on the right here, I'm showing the uh, Imperial Postmaster General Francesco Tassis, uh, who is shown handing the mail to his patron, the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian. And in fact, this tapestry is of his commissioning and located in Brussels. Uh, by the 1530s, the Tassas effectively oversee this uh, pan-European network of postal routes for their Habsburg patrons, uh, which stretch all the way from the Netherlands to Naples and Spain to Austria. A rather a key step in this is the establishment of uh, postal way stations across the Brenner Pass. The Tassas are effectively acting as a kind of government contractor, and this, the postal system as a whole is a part private, part public operation. So for example, while it's certainly heavily subsidized by their royal patrons, many of the postal way stations are located at inns. So the horses will be rented out when not in use and the uh, postal lieutenants will serve as travel guides. It is a multipolar family network uh, with Tassas brothers and nephews frequently on the road, either overseeing the posts or alternatively, as we see here, located at the court to essentially serve at the beck and call of the ruler. They, Tassas family members remain active in the papal and Venetian postal systems as well as the imperial posts. Um, and this facilitates many of the early interpostal agreements that make transalpine communications possible. However, this introduces its own issues as family branches become established across Europe. The inheritance of rights and privileges especially um, creates competition between the different family branches. And there's several points where this almost collapses the entire enterprise. In fact, uh, Charles himself, Emperor Charles and uh, Cardinal Granvelle uh, mediate among Tassa's family members at various points in time. However, it never fully dissolves this family firm. And this is the first point where I think uh, Tassas women actually play quite an important role. Marriage serves three important uh, roles for the Tassas. The first is that it establishes local credibility and status, much like you know, many other kinds of uh, diplomatic or governorship endeavors. Uh, brides often come from rather well-regarded patrician families, and this is the case for uh, Christine von Wachtendock in the Netherlands, as well as uh, Magdalena von Neuhaus in uh, Friuli. Much as their Austrian patrons enjoy the riches of Venus, several key marriages also take place between Tassas family members and members of the Bordogna and Zapata families, um, who enjoy their own postal dynasties around Trento and Naples and Sicily, respectively. Uh, this marriage between Antonio Tassis and Cristina Allegra de Zapata is actually one of several, so, such that um, Cristina is herself the daughter of Allegra Tassis um, and Juan Zapata, the postmaster of Naples. 
Finally, as Tassa's family fortunes grow and inheritance battles loom large, intermarriages between the different branches of the family uh, consolidate the family interest and affirm that this is a mutual endeavor. On the left, I've presented a map of the postal way stations along what I call the Swiss and German roads. And I'm adopting the Tassus uh, designators. They tend to refer to these as the Via Alemania or the Via Svizzera, really referring to a collection of routes. So um, to provide some further detail on this map, uh, it's deriving from printed postal itineraries, the ones that I address in the article that appeared this summer. Um, and so each of these points is representing the location of one of these way stations. I'm showing three different points in time as represented by these itineraries, uh, which illustrates that this endeavor grows out from this initial Via Alemania crossing the Brenner Pass. Um, by the 1560s, 1560s, we have a number of routes crossing Switzerland. And then by the 17th century, extending these routes all the way to Prague, where of course the Royal Court is located at one point, um, and then all the way to Cologne, which eventually becomes an alternative route to reach Antwerp. We see the centrality of one office from both this map, but also the pattern of intermarriage. And that's the post office located at Augsburg. Uh, so we can see how uh, various marriages are meant to tie together the uh, imperial postmastership, which is based in Brussels and Antwerp, uh, and then the Spanish postmastership following the split of uh, the uh, dynastic holdings between the King of Spain and the Holy Roman Emperor on Charles V's abdication. Augsburg plays an especially important role tying together this entire network, especially in transalpine uh, traffic. And in fact, we have a wonderful image of the Augsburg post office um, in the early 17th century. In addition to their role in these marriage alliances, we see a very noticeable pattern of Tassa's postmistressship by the late 16th and early 17th centuries. Here I've highlighted just a few to give you a sense of what this network looks like. Um, and this is a network that they form and in many cases oversee. It's worth noting that it's not just Tassus women who are acting as postmistresses. Um, and of course, one of the weird things about a postal system is that you have postmasters and postmistresses overseeing other postmistresses and postmasters. So actually there's an agreement in 1596, which demonstrates that there's at least four different postmistresses overseeing these way stations in the Tyrolean region. And anecdotally, I've come across uh, far more in the course of my research, um, located, I think, with increasing frequency across the Alpine region by the late 16th century. Postmistresses simply make sense um, from the perspective of a family firm. I think most of us working on early modern uh, trade of any kind will be familiar with this pattern. These are, for the most part, widows who inherit the titles from their husbands and then continue to oversee the office during the age of minority of their young sons. In theory, many of them, as we'll see, continue to do so long past the age of majority for their sons. Historically, it's often been assumed that they were more or less placeholders for the title. Um, and to quote one source that postal lieutenants, the essentially male employees, uh, handled much of the real day to day business. More recently, historians working especially under uh, the publishing auspices of the uh, museum, the Tasso Family Museum, um, have reappraised this reputation. I rely especially on these two books uh, by uh, Francesca Brunet and Marco Gerosa, which focus on the offices and the family branches associated with Milan and Trento. Of the three postmistresses that I'll talk about today, Lucina Catanea Tassas is the one about whom I've done the most um, archival research in the course of my project. Lucina Catanea is descended from an aristocratic family of Bergamo and a minor uh, Milanese nobility branch. Um, she marries postmaster Ruggiero Tassas in 1572, who at the time is 30 years her senior. He dies uh, at a rather precarious time. And that's what I'm showing down here. Um, in the 1580s, this route had been established as a cooperative venture between the Spanish post office of Milan and the Venetian company of couriers. Uh, it was in effect one of the first international postal treaties and it requires negotiating some rather politically tense boundaries as I'm sure Luca Zanobi will talk more about today. This was nonetheless a crucial cisalpine artery that opens up the Swiss roads, especially to greater traffic. And as you can see, it's run on uh, essentially twice a week with one courier journeying towards Milan and then one journeying towards Venice. 
On the postmaster's death, the title of the post office of Milan passes to a more noble branch of the family located in Spain. Uh, leasing the office to Castanea Tassis is essentially, um, it offers the benefits of familial continuity, uh, especially without some of the accusations of political and commercial partisanship that had increasingly tarred uh, the Cremonese as well as Genovese candidates for that office. Katsuneatasis appears under several different titles in the archives, but especially the term that I've used for uh, this talk, the conductrix in, uh, in administratrix, uh, essentially the female form of both conductor and administrator. Katsuneatasis lives and works quite closely with a postal lieutenant named Ottavio Codogno. Um, Codogno quite overshadows uh, Katsuneatasis in much of the historiography, in part because he publishes two rather famous postal itinerary books that offer a great deal of insight into how postal systems are actually run. But I'd say there's good reason to believe that she was quite hands-on in running the office with him, that it was in fact a partnership. In April of 1598, for example, Katanea Tassis received a rather rare privilege, which is the ability to represent herself in notarial transactions. Usually within Milanese notarial culture, she would need to be represented by a male relative, but instead she can act in her own name, as we see, and what I believe to be her hand, um, a signature identifying herself. In, uh, the advocacy that she, she's actually quite active in advocating for the office and specifically the uh, protection of the postal monopoly that provides uh, most of its income. She's able to do so by essentially uh, rhetorically presenting herself as defending the office for her young sons. Um, however, this of course, she is active enough to earn the reputation of being quote, a capricious woman with a temper uh, from some of the Milanese officials. In fact, her post office comes into the crosshairs of the Spanish visitation, which is a form of royal audit, essentially. They, uh, Katsunea Tassis and Condonio have to defend against charges of fraud and embezzlement. Um, and in order to form these fraud, uh, fraud charges, the Spanish visitor actually interviews many of the couriers, which is a fantastic source material. These couriers have plenty of grievances with Katsunea Tassis, um, and they make clear that they're frequently dealing with her in person. But they also express a great deal of sympathy for the rather awkward position she's in uh, as the leaseholder of the office. Uh, one courier recalls Captain Atasis actually handing him silver candlesticks and in another instance, a fine dress for him to sell to pay for his journey uh, because the Mil Milanese treasury is quite slow in reimbursing the office for their costs. These um, grievances that the couriers have, interestingly, never insult or question her on the basis of her gender. Um, they, they really never say that she is unable to carry out the job in any uh, shape or form. It's simply disagreements about the nature of their pay and reimbursement, especially. So next I'll discuss, um, I'll move a little bit north to talk about the Imperial Postmistress General, Alexandrine von Rai und Taxis. And once again, after the abdication of Charles, the, uh, the Habsburg Tassis system is effectively split into the Spanish post office and the Imperial post office. Although the postmasters and postmistresses are still very much expected to work together. Um, Rai von Taxis inherits uh, the imperial postal system from her husband, um, and she also inherits a number of its headaches. This includes an ongoing and highly publicized court battle with the former postmaster of Frankfurt, who had, in the course of the Thirty Years' War, become the Swedish postmaster general. This disgruntled employee claims with some valid reason that he had been unfairly dismissed by her husband, um, especially because of partisan reasons and rather trumped up charges that he had been uh, conducting espionage for Protestant leaders. Much as Katsunea Tassis has to defend the family business against the Spanish visitation, um, so too does uh, Rai von Taxis de defend the, uh, the imperial monopoly against the incursion by new Protestant and regional systems within the Holy Roman Empire. <clears throat> um, Rai von Texas also takes on a major marketing campaign, uh, which is essentially to negotiate new uh, treaties that will connect the English system into the system of continental post offices. One of the many complaints raised against her and her lieutenants is the accusation that English mail is being routinely opened along the German road. 
The English ambassador, Sir Balthazar Gerbier, um, is convinced that the postmistress is effectively running an intelligencing operation in the model of later black chambers. He instructs his successor in how to avoid sending letters by her office for that reason. Um, and a lot of this work, I should say, has been done by Nadine Ackerman, who also finds that uh, Alexandrine de Rye-Fontaxis is active in smuggling correspondence for Elizabeth Stewart, um, specifically helping her to avoid the surveillance by her brother, the king. This opens the door to considering the role of postmistresses in espionage, um, and arguably they're protected in some ways from these accusations of partisanship that are lobbied against their husbands um, by their gender, the, the notion that their gender is unpolitical in some shape or form. Another of her legacies, which is worth mentioning, is that she commissions a massive and beautifully illustrated genealogy of the family. Her son is later able to use this work to prove the historical descendancy of the family um, from the Della Torre family in Milan, which adds the Turin to the Turin and Toxis as we tend to know them today. Time check. Great. Um, so I'm only going to briefly address uh, the postmistress of Trento, unfortunately, here. Um, however, she is a fascinating figure, and we luckily have this portrait of her that you see on the right. Um, she's shown here sorting the mail between Brussels, Augsburg, and Innsbruck, those major destinations of the German road. Um, and similar to the other postmistresses I've talked about, she's widowed at a relatively young age and takes over in the stead of her sons. However, she remains the postmistress after her sons reach the age of majority, which seems to suggest that either she's loath to pass the baton or that she's simply more competent than her offspring. And I'll, I'll return to this. Um, interestingly, she claims to be illiterate and unable to understand or speak German, which is frankly a little hard to believe given the nature of the office. It may be that this is similarly uh, serves somewhat of a reputation goal, that it indicates that uh, especially Protestant German mail is not being opened and read. Um, although, of course, there's uh, plenty of reason to believe that this is indeed happening, especially uh, at uh, places like Trento and Augsburg. So to conclude, I'd say that these examples demonstrate that postmistressship is a sustained and at the time largely unquestioned phenomenon across the 16th through 17th centuries. Postmistresses play an active role in the day-to-day -day affairs of the postal service, which since the beginning of the 16th century had been more about overseeing staff, um, bookkeeping and negotiation than it had been running missions in person. When we think about the family firm structure of the post offices, this makes a great deal of sense. And in fact, one of the things that I'll talk about in the book is that the notion of this being a state office and a public figure is a later development, that this is in many ways a, uh, an early utility in that it is both a family business and uh, increasingly uh, a state monopoly. This better documented activity of postmistresses should also make us reappraise the role of Tassus women in general, um, who are frequently less documented, of course, than their postmistress counterparts. In addition to the other benefits of intermarriage, it seems likely that Tassus women were active in the family enterprise prior to their marriages, uh, therefore bringing a familiarity and a skill set that would benefit their husbands. The skill set served them well when things such as ambassadorial duties took their husbands away and abroad, which happened several times, including the Spanish post uh, master general, um, but also in their widowhood as they fight to protect a family legacy. This is not unlike the role that we see women playing in many other trades. Um, and I see special parallels here to other communications trades, such as print publishing. Um, I want to note as well the demographic pressures um, from plague to violence that are creating this uh, space for women to occupy. Uh, Jeanette Fregulia finds frequent partnerships between uh, widows and male appointees in Milan especially um, as a result of the plagues in that region and then I would say probably the endemic violence that follows for many decades. Uh, this is oftentimes formalized as a societa or a limited term investment agreement, um, which really does fit uh, the model that we see between Lucina Catenea and um, Codogno. 
And then there's the matter of the sons. So both Catania Tassus's sons and uh, Ropelle Bordogna Fontaxis's sons um, become involved in tavern brawls and murders, um, flee the law, <laughs> which is a pattern that is not dissimilar to uh, young, uh, you know, up and coming families across Northern Italy uh, in the late 16th and early 17th centuries. So the, the women take over in many ways for uh, both their deceased husbands, but also their potentially profitable get sons. Um, finally, I'll very briefly advance a final hypothesis, which is the one that I'm somewhat drawn to in the course of this book, um, which is this idea of women being unpolitical actors. Um, this idea that perhaps postmistresses offer a special safety for communications when there's this growing concern about espionage and counter-espionage um, by virtue of appearing to be unpartisan um, and, and especially being able to mobilize this rhetoric of defending a family legacy rather than pursuing self-interest. So thank you for your time, and I look forward to hearing the rest of the papers. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that wonderful paper. Such a great start to the workshop. Um, I'm sure there will be many questions, um, and we'll take questions after the end of uh, this panel. So we'll just quickly move to our second speaker, um, Joanne Anderson. Uh, Joanne is a reader in art history and head of discipline at the University of Aberdeen. Uh, she specializes in late medieval and renaissance art in Italy and the Alps with uh, interests including the representation of Mary Magdalene, art and landscape, female patronage and exhibition history. And uh, her numerous publications also include a monograph entitled Moving with the Magdalene, Late Medieval Art and Devotion in the Alps. And today, Joanne will be speaking about artistic workshop practice in the Alps, typologies and diffusion. So Joanne, the floor is all yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Sandra, and thank you for that kind introduction and to for inviting me along to this wonderful panel. I shall start sharing my screen now. Is that working okay? Yeah, works perfectly. Lovely. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for attending today. Thanks both to Sandra and Rosa for the kind invitation to speak at this um, fantastic interdisciplinary workshop on mobility and infrastructures of mobility in the Alps. I'm really looking forward to um, the discussions. So to start off, um, from wall paintings and sculpture to stone cutting and construction, the Alps were a boom territory for artisans willing to travel to ply their trade. A single valley could yield a high number of churches, chapels, castles and houses, leading to opportunities for workshop monopolies and with that the rise of distinctive visual cultures. It is a distinctive market, dynamic in the mountains, one might say. Available artistic labour, whether solicited or fortuitous, produced imagery for sites that served community needs that were both inward and outward looking in terms of their networks. In the supply and demand model, modes of workshop practice, namely their typologies and the pathways of transmission are significant. My paper today is going to address artistic workshop practice in the Alps, and specifically the question of how such businesses were organized and how they were maintained over the course of a year, but also across the generations. I'm gonna be drawing on the research that I have conducted on the cult of Mary Magdalene, alongside some other research that has built out from this um, initial large scale study. Um, since this has allowed me to identify topologies that could account for the way that imagery of that particular saint, but also other imagery, was diffused across mountain terrain. Um, some of the material I'm going to admit here is drawn from a period earlier than that of this research workshop. So I hope you're going to forgive me for pulling you back a little bit further. Um, but um, um, I feel it's important to set up a number of these typologies as I move forward into um, the 15th and 16th centuries to help us think collectively about the mobility of people, ideas and images. Um, and alongside of that, I'm um, hoping to think about um, the links um, to the duration and experience of art in such landscapes. So I really will be dialing you back and I promise I will be going through these um, promptly so that um, we can get to the later material. 
Um, but just first of all, um, a map just to indicate the areas that um, I've been looking at um, across all of my scholarship to date um, linked to the Alps and um, the uh, diffusion of workshops um, um, from local um, valleys and staying within these valleys to those that have moved um, further, uh, making use of the transit networks and um, the mountain passes. So the typologies that um, I've pulled out from the research that I've conducted over the years here are the ones that are set out. And I'm just going to go through um, with a, an example of each of them um, in this paper. So first of all, thinking about the local master and workshop. And um, this first type emerged um, from study of this particular sculpted altarpiece um, dated to the late 13th century in the Palazzo Madama in Turin. And it's a large and sumptuous looking object, notable for the profusion of carved details that populate each scene taken from the biblical and apocryphal lives of Mary Magdalene. It would have been painted and gilded, taking on the appearance of a large scale um, reliquary with visible connection to the late Roman sarcophagi that were then found in the crypt of the convent of saint Maximin la saint bomme in southern France, which had claimed the relics of the saints since 1279. So although it was made of locally, this object here, local and readily available um, materials, its original appearance pointed away to other lands via established and significant transit routes. The altarpiece likely um, originated from a church in Carema in the Austa Valley, a strategic toll point on a branch of one of the most important pilgrimage routes in Europe, the Via Francigena. The village fell under feudal rule of the Valese family, but also served the buying lords of nearby Pont San Martin and Castruzione, whose bridges and uh, converging roads channeled merchant and other profitable footfall for the easy collection of taxes in this mountainous terrain. The village attracted the services of the Europa master and his workshop, a group of artisans active throughout the Piedmont and Austa Valley up until the 1330s. Prior to his work in Carema, and just to show you the view down onto the valley and the village, the master had just completed his first big commission for the Eusebian Sacellum at the Santa Maria Europa in Biella, a pilgrimage site in the nearby valley. The master was evidently used to traveling for work in the local area and had been engaged in at, one least, in at least one prestigious commission that was linked to the cult of relics, pointing to the business practice of artisans and the economics of demand in their local territories. So typology one. Number two is the imported master to a region. In this case, um, my case study has always been looking at the Valtensberg master in uh, the Swiss Grisons. And this is a master whose style came to dominate the local visual culture via the workshop system during the first half of the 14th century. He was an artist brought to the Zurich court, most likely from the Bodensee. He was active in the northern part of the Swiss Grisons between 1330 and 1350, but the numerous surviving works across the valleys of the lower canton attest to his mobility and monopoly, as in the case of the Europa master in his workshop. Now, the Valtensberg master was trained in the simple elegance evidenced in the illustrations of the famous Codex Manese, as illustrated on the left of the slide, a book of epigrammatic poetry and balladry produced at the court of Zurich from 1300 to 1340. When compared to the fresco paintings in the tiny mountain chapel of Santa Maria Magdalena in Dusch in the Donlech Valley, we immediately see affinities that speak to the diffusion of visual forms and aesthetics, the almond-shaped eyes, tilted heads and striated hairs, this thick corded hair that looks almost sculptural, um, are shared properties. The master painter and his workshop were active throughout the Asian Alps and just sorry just to um, point out like where the little church actually is and I'll just come back to um, these slides in a moment but um, the um, workshop were active throughout the Rhaetian Alps, including Reitzuns, Zillis, Kovalden, Valtensburg, and Kur, the regional capital of um, Grabunden, most notably in its cathedral. So this is just one small patch where this master was um, active. Now, Kur was around 12.5 miles away from Douche, reminding us that such workshops were able to cover reasonable and substantial distances on established transit routes working up, down and through the valleys. And so it evidences one kind of migratory practice of artists who supplied wall paintings for mountain communities 
in that the, Wal the Waltonsboro master traveled into vast yet defined territory. He built up a workshop and worked the valleys systematically. And this slide here that I've taken from the um, Google aerial shots just reminds us all as Alpine specialists here just about these parallel valleys and the ways in which um, workshops would have to negotiate this. Um, just moving up and down the valleys to opportunities where they can ply their trade in the local area. So this is a kind of systematic way of working for this imported talent and how he employs um, workshops throughout the area to distribute his visual style. So each settlement, small settlement in this landscape offers the potential for the diffusion of style and iconographies. But just coming back to these two little slides here of this small church um, in the Domlesh Valley is not reminding us that not only are the workshops having to travel up um, the valley floors um, between different um, localities where they can pick up commissions, that some of their projects are actually up the sides of the valleys, up into the foothills of the, of the mountains, involving further travel. And so this just gives a more experience-based understanding of what was it was like to travel to site to work. These are the pathways that we as historians, art historians, now have to travel to get first-hand engagement with the artworks that still survive within its walls inside the building and outside projecting out into the landscape. So I'm going to on to my next one. So this third typology that is slightly enfolded with a fourth on um, seasonal migration is the master engaged with um, the foreign style. And this um, third type of workshop practice is in evidence um, in the Church of St. Johannes in Sturz in the Albula Valley in the Reation Alps. So we're sort of staying in the same locality here. And um, we can see the church um, just sitting there um, in the little village high up in, in the mountains above the Albula Valley. Now, the um, exterior and interior paintings of this particular church are dated um, in the 1310s and the 1360s to 70s, two campaigns of painting. And um, on closer inspection, sorry, like I'm um, just to give you an idea of um, the church sitting high up on the edge of the, um, the precipice leading down onto the valley. And you can see here this very linear village style. Um, and in the top, I'm sure if you can see my arrow here around Stuhls and along to latch these upper valleys um, and little villages, hamlets sitting here. And this is in relation to the larger village of Burgoon down on the valley floor. So there's a certain sense of surveillance down um, from these points. Um, but on the exterior of this um, very, very small church um, is an exterior painting belonging to the 1360s and 70s, right next door to um, a painting of St. Christopher belonging to the 1310s, indicating multiple campaigns over the course of 100 years. Inside the church um, is more visual riches, and um, these paintings here um, indicating the dissemination of um, northern Italian style, particularly from the Venetian region, are dating to 1360 and to 70. And what's interesting is that my research has um, thrown, um, shown up as in agreement with um, existing scholarship, very rich scholarship on the diffusion via Bolzano and um, Bozzi Bolzano, and um, the diffusion of the Northern Italian style, first of all, starting with um, the work of Giotto and Guariento and Giusto de Manaboy, bringing it up, diffusing it through the, Bol the local Bolzano school, and then this being then pushed out up further into the mountains and across the passes into the Grabunden, where a small little hamlet such as um, Stulz suddenly becomes recipient to rather high quality um, and paintings um, from another region. So um, the responsible workshop um, probably came from the county of Tyrol and um, via the regional centre of Bozen. And they will have traveled into the region using the Albula Pass, um, a journey taking of at least two days on foot, assuming that pathway and um, most particularly climate conditions are favorable. And um, as part of the seasonal migration of um, workshops, this typology, um, what I've um, called a, a certain passing through type of migration merging, whereby a seasonal workshop would meet the demands of a specific parish or valley based on availability, just the chance of the workshop passing through. It would explain why such a small church situated off the principal route 
down the valley would attract such a high caliber and hybrid style workshop. An urban centre might offer such a workshop the most promising prospects in the form of a larger well-paid jobs, but the multiplicity of smaller rural settlements also each provided work, shelter, food and some income vital in the peasant and artisanal economy. So the act of passing through as part of seasonal migration was also evident in the numerous churches of um, the Upper Engadine family, uh, Valley, including in San Maria in Pontresina. And this church was dedicated to Mary Magdalene for a brief period and in the late 15th century, where a northern Italian workshop was responsible for an extensive fresco cycle depicting scenes from the saint's life around 1497. So the workshop appears to have moved from church to church in the valley before returning south, following the typical model here that we're seeing in Stills, but also um, pulling forward that model from um, the Valtensburg master. So this typology is um, quite key um, to my new research on the temporality of art in the Alps, how long communities live with their painted walls and decorated altars before they feel the need to repair, upgrade or replace, or indeed have the option to actually um, take on this kind of work in the first place. With so many of the localities that I work on being remote, the infrastructures of mobility are critical. Diffusion requires networks that are well trodden and maintained. So the final one is the long term migration. So the final typology that I'm going to talk about is linked to the idea of the promised land. In this case, a surplus occurs in the home territory, necessitating a shift in strategy, a newly identified market with a deficit identified that would require substantial travel from home. And in this case, I refer to the Basquenas di Avararia, a prolific dynasty of painters who hailed originally from Lombardy. They lived and worked in the Avarara Valley near Bergamo before market forces pushed a smaller branch of the family to migrate east in the mid-15th century towards emerging opportunities in the Diocese of Trento, namely the upper valleys of the Giudicari, Val Rendena, the Val di Non and Val di Sole. And here you can see I've just listed the two dynasties split there with Giovanni and Battista and the Basquenis and the painters of the church that you can see in front of us being members of that minor branch. Um, a boom in church building or restructuring of such buildings in these valleys um, gave rise to the migration of um, skilled stone cutters from Lombardy and um, facilitated the opportunity for painters to follow and such a family workshop who would come to dominate production between 1450 and 1677. My particular research on this um, from um, doctoral studies right through to now has taken me to the church um, of Santa Maddalena in Cusiano, where I've worked on the paintings of the saint attributed to the brothers Giovanni and Battista. Now this fraternal enterprise of these brothers um, which, which, who were responsible for the Magdalene paintings in Cusiano, home was in Lombardy and specifically the Val Brembana. Giovanni returned there in 1486 for fresco work before traveling back to Trentino in 1490 for a job in Cunevo. He then joined up with Battista in 1496 to paint in a castle chapel in Tessulo, a little higher up the Val de Non. It is therefore likely that their combined services were requested in Cusiano, in this um, church dedicated to the Magdalene, in the nearby Val de Sole during the period 1490 to 96, though still now the, the date range for the paintings remains within the 1470 to 97 period. Um, so it, but it must be um, considered that it might have been in the late 1470s prior to Giovanni's return to his homeland, um, given their early activity in the Val di Non. So these were brothers who were moving back and forth. They had committed to this migration over to Trentino, but work from home could still occasionally pull them back over um, into their home territories. Now, in the brothers' workshop, there was a division of labour according to ability that reinforces our picture of organised practice. And here I've drawn on the invaluable study of the Basquenis by Silvia Vernaccini, um, one brother specialised in the depiction of figures and others in the decorative and ornamental features, facilitating the swift completion and consistency in production. They had assistance for the preparation of plaster, grinding of pigments and construction of scaffolding, wall preparation and illumination. Maintaining a workshop in the Alps was as pragmatic a task as elsewhere, and so the brothers 
would have hired um, assistants and runners in each locality. Commissions would have included upfront payment of materials and labour alongside basic board and lodgings, with expediency the order of the day, keeping the workshop on site for the duration was beneficial to both sides. Um, we might easily say that these um, brothers here are purveyors of um, sacred images, rejecting um, rootedness in favour of what Papano and Rice have called craft labour and craft life as forms of practice and bodies of knowledge and realms of experience. Through, in this case, it is applied to the mountain territory. And this is something that I have explored um, previously of how the brothers have brought um, um, visual information, visual iconographies um, from their homelands into the um, iconography of this particular image cycle, but also been receptive to the performative cultures in Trentino and in um, particularly in Bozen. Um, linked between sacred theatre and um, painted cycles. So there's this idea of, as I say, um, forms of practice and bodies of knowledge. But returning to the principle of home, it is my contention that a principle of home applies to the topologies covered in this paper, a single point of origin from which the seasonal migration of labour springs and eventually returns, even if it is a couple of centuries later. Many were single family enterprises, but pluralistic organizations were particularly advantageous for sustained and successful practices, especially in the face. There is unquestionable common ground with late medieval guild structures across Europe. But what is interesting about the Alpine territories is how the principle of home was applied in a vast landscape, bringing the near and far together. Just quickly to um, enlarge on this point, this practice continued into the early modern period. Um, the example that I've um, typically leaned on here would be the Awa Zumft, a federation of master builders and handworkers from the Bregenzerwald in the Braalberg in High Austria, founded in around 1650, where members were drawn from the villages in the area with Au as the centre of the federation, and they also formed a religious brotherhood. Working for the collective good was the priority. No matter the distance between home and site of contract, workers were required to spread the labour among their brethren. Family inheritance ensured the honouring of contracts and with it a continuity of designs. To come back to the orchestrating principle of seasonal migration from a single point of origin, it was traditional practice of the Arab Federation to meet around springtime on the Red Mountain at Hitasau before fanning out to the work sites in the region to implement agreed designs and standards. It was a highly formalised system for the diffusion of labour, form and style, and it was a system that sprang from medieval practice. And this practice was intrinsically linked to the ease of mobility throughout the terrain. So just to conclude, how workshops negotiated mountain terrain was down to a number of factors, but one might want to remind ourselves about um, the influence of climate and the management of roads and passes. As Alpine specialists, we all know how seasonal weather dictates mobility. Winter was no time for the production of art. Snowfalls could close off valleys for up to six months of the year and damp conditions were not ideal for painting wet plaster, assembling wooden altarpieces or for the more fundamental construction processes. Seasons and weather affect the pace of change and with that, the experience of art. And the second factor about control and maintenance. As Guido Castelnuovo observed in his essay, Strada Passi Cues in Alpi nel Basso Medioevo in the catalogue accompanying the outstanding exhibition Il Gotico nel Alpi, um, quite a number of years ago now, but so, so still such a wonderful thing. Transit was a negotiation of different powers. This is something I've referred to above in relation to the Karema altarpiece in the first typology, but also more recently, as I've explored in an essay on arming the Alps through art in the recently published Travel and Conflict in the Early Modern World. There, I focused on the Feamala in the Graubünden, where the maintenance of the road by both lord and community was critical to the commercial success of nearby villages, as recounted in the 1473 um, Feamala brief. It also led to the appearance of art that searched as, uh, served as watchmen for those who were passing by, sacred martial types, Christopher and George, that could dominate the visual landscape on the sides of churches and castles. The surveillance art was produced in part by the second type of worship I spoke about at the beginning of this paper, the important master whose style came to dominate the regional visual culture through the workshop system. So to conclude here in this way, I would say that Alps in the Alps, it is intrinsically linked to the infrastructures of mobility as linked to power, 
money and in many of my case examples of faith. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Jan, Joanne, both for the for the paper and also for all those vivid images that you showed us of the of the art and the physical environment that they are located in in these uh, alpine regions that you're studying. Um, so um, we'll just uh, quickly move to our third speaker so that we have enough time for the discussion. Um, uh, that is uh, Luca Zenobi, who is uh, who holds a PhD from the University of Oxford and is currently a research fellow in Cambridge. And his book entitled Borders and the Politics of Space in Late Medieval Italy will be published next year with Oxford University Press. Um, and among his various publications, um, Joanne, I think you're still uh, sharing your screen. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Luca, uh, Luca's publications um, include also the special issue of the Journal of Early Modern History, which uh, was entitled Cities in Motion, and which he co-edited together with um, Rosa, which just came out before summer. And his paper today is entitled Anything to Declare, Moving Goods Between the Alps and the Po Valley in the 15th Century. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Sandra, and, and thank you to both you and, and Rosa for the invitation. I hope you can all see my screen. I trust that's a yes. Yes. Okay, brilliant. Okay. Um, so if you've been following the news lately, um, you know that the UK is dealing with some serious shortages following Brexit. Some supermarkets are struggling to get their hands on essential items such as chicken, fresh vegetable, vegetables and fruits. Many have had to adjust their prices to reflect the hiring of new drivers to move suppliers and also lawyers to make sense of the changing bureaucracies that those new rules uh, brought along. Not to mention the increasing cost of fuel, food and also fuel um, imported from uh, Europe. But of course, that is not the first time that uh, something like this happens and it certainly won't be the last. And it really all comes down to a challenge uh, which is as old as society itself, and that is the challenge of finding a balance between the necessity for products to move from producers to consumers as needed, and the desire and to a certain extent uh, requirement as well to exercise some control over that uh, movement. Now, there are times like these last few weeks in the UK when the existing balance between movement and control is broken and a new one has to be established. And 15th century Italy was not different. It was also a time when new rules were put in place, even though the patterns of exchange uh, remained largely the same. So that's what I'll do in this paper. I'll have a look at what changed and what didn't as a new balance uh, was found and reflect on what that can tell us about the infrastructures which uh, made it all possible. I'm going to start by looking back to the world of independent uh, city-states between the 12th and, say, early 14th uh, century. That's because I'm a medievalist by training, so I'm kind of programmed at birth to, to look backward, but also because this is the time when many key systems and facilities for controlling the movement of goods in the region were first uh, established. Systems and facilities which would often remain in place well into early modernity. So developing ways to channel the circulation of products from and to their territories was typically one of the very few first uh, things that cities did as they established the contadi. Urban centers were growing both in size and population, so it was crucial to find a way to compel producers to send their products directly to the city's own consumers and not somewhere else. Uh, you probably know some of the strategies they employed. Some of them are pretty well known. Uh, most cities prohibited markets to be held outside urban walls, which in turn had the effect of directing traffic flows towards the only available uh, center. Some established quarters uh, of products produced in the countryside that all of the villages uh, of the Contado had to transfer directly to the city. We also, also forced products to move in a predictable uh, pattern. But in the end, all cities follow the same principle. If you wish to move any product between Contadi, uh, so from the territory of one city to that of another, you first have to pay the equivalent of modern custom duties, namely taxes on products crossing borders. 
Uh, these taxes could vary over time, depending on the sort of movement that cities wish to encourage and what instead they were looking to prevent. But the principle remained the same. The contadi were the framework which most affected the movement of things. Let's compare that now with the 15th century. The political map of the peninsula looks very different. Uh, instead of a multitude of independent cities, we now have a smaller number of regional powers, such as the duchies of Milan and Savoy. Much like Europe and the United Kingdom today, they were faced with the challenge of finding a new balance between movement and control, while also trying to adapt to the infrastructures that were already in place. Uh, so many things had changed. And more importantly for our scopes, cities were no longer in charge of the politics of mobility. Regional powers like Milan, Savoy, Venice, the Republic of Venice, uh, the Republic of Florence, etc., they were in, in charge at the moment. But ultimately, the challenge was still the same. It was the challenge of challenging channeling uh, traffic flows in a way that benefits your own people and not uh, those of neighboring polities. And the reasons to tackle that challenge were also the same. Uh, population has started to grow again after the shock of the Black Death. So making sure that essential items, starting from food, found their way to all consumers was once again a matter of public order. And on top of that, we shouldn't forget that custom duties made up a huge portion of state revenues. Um, so the period I'm most interested in is that immediately following the Peace of Lodi. Um, in 1454, as you all know, this treaty brought an end to a long series of conflicts in northern Italy, establishing a new political geography in the peninsula, but also allowing for new traffics to finally take place. So today I'll use sources from the Duchy of Milan in particular, which is the area I know best. Uh, but from samples I've seen from other archives, I suspect that much of what I found for Lombardy can be applied to most regions at the footholds of the Italian Alps. Um, so we can learn a lot about what it meant to move products around in this context, and uh, thanks to two different and in fact complementary kinds of sources. The first is uh, normative sources. So um, pieces of legislation which a central power, in this case, Duke of Milan, introduced across their dominion. And in Milan, at least, these were issued the legislation never passed, um, relevant to these matters at least, in dedicated manuscripts, uh, like the one you can see in the slide. And obviously, these are a great source of information uh, on all of this stuff. They provide us with a pretty accurate picture of the ways in which goods were supposed to uh, circulate, covering pretty much every scenario. There are only two exemptions, which um, are those that I mentioned earlier. So the quota that rural communities were expected to bring straight to the closest urban center, which is something that continued uh, all the way through the 15th century, and the share of products that will naturally be duties. Once you set those exceptions aside, the forms of movement regulated by this corpus of legislation really come down to only two types. Um, the first is the transfer of goods coming from any land or territory under ducal rule, but headed outside the ducal dominium, extra dominium nostrum. That's how the sources put it at least. The other type is the movement of goods from one province of the ducal dominion to another, the uno districto nostro ad alium nostrum districto. Uh, throughout the ducal ordinances, you find that they maintain a formal distinction between movement across external frontiers and movement across internal boundaries. But ultimately, the text of the law is, is very similar especially uh, in all cases in which products had to cross uh, any kind of border. And there are two rules in particular that come up time and time again, and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of report them back to you just to give you a sense of the way in which they try to uh, regulate these matters. The first rule is that all people carrying marketable, marketable products or products that could be sold on were expected to perform their journey via the most direct and well-known well-known route, 
which meant that they were liable to be stopped if uh, if if the ducal officers found them trying to cut a, cut across the main itineraries. Um, if we are to trust the many complaints that local officers sent to Milan, uh, these rules were put in place to prevent uh, valuable products from being sold before reaching their final destination, or even worse, from being diverted into enemy markets by, by local smugglers. The second rule that comes up um, again, again, again and again in this uh, corpus of legislation is that people moving products across any type of border, so both internal and external, were required to visit the closest custom point. These were physical sites at which the movement of goods could be closely monitored and also the collection of duties could be could, could take place. Um, so Rosa will be disappointed to hear this, but we don't know much about the architecture of these buildings. But we know that they were typically located where the territorial border intersected with either trading hubs, such as market towns located not far from the border, or uh, transit areas such as uh, crossroads and river crossings, so think uh, fords and bridges, etc. So, based on normative sources alone, I think we can already reach some preliminary conclusion, which is that no matter the apparent changes to the political map of the region in the 15th century, moving things around in Lombardy was still fundamentally shaped by the geography as well as infrastructures of the old city states. One way to wrap your head around this fact is that is to think about a European Union where hard economic borders are still in place and you still have to stop at the custom office when driving to Austria through the Brenner Pass, uh, for instance. Now, we can enrich this first picture and conclusion with more precise details by using a complementary kind of source, and that is uh, travel documents. These were not unknown at the time of the city-states, but it is only in the 15th century with the rise of larger regional powers that their use became not only widespread, but central to the functioning of the broader politics of mobility. And since we are trying to reconstruct the mechanics through which goods were moved from producers to consumers, I'm going to be looking at one category of travel documents in particular, and that is trade licenses. In the Dutch of Milan list, these were used to regulate the circulation of all essential supplies, including wheat and other grains, but also legumes, wine, sometimes even animal fodder. They were issued in the form of a patent, uh, an open letter, which travelers were expected to present to uh, border officers. And as you can imagine, since these letters traveled with the individuals who had requested them, almost all of them have gone lost, but we still have record of their issuing in the ducal archives. In the period that I'm looking at, uh, so the one sort of immediately following the Peace of Lodi uh, in 1454, the Milanese Chancery recorded every trade license that they issued in a dedicated uh, manuscript. Uh, they call this the Liber Albus, the white book. Um, the, liber, the Liber itself was destroyed uh, a few decades uh, later uh, in the period that uh, Rachel is looking at, um, but I was able to find a fag fragment of it in the archive, so let me tell you about that for a second. The fragment is large enough to offer data on about uh, 300 licenses or so. Um, they were issued over the course of almost a year, from the summer of uh, 1454, so immediately after the Peace of Lodi, to the spring of 1455, so about 10 months or so. Um, and as you can see from the page that I put up in the slide, the, the record of uh, each license is actually pretty short, it's just a paragraph. But this includes really everything you need. Uh, it has the date on which the license was granted, its duration, the name of the person who had requested it, obviously, the quantity of goods that was moved, their origin, destination, and sometimes you even find the precise itineraries and custom points that uh, the people uh, to whom the license had been granted were supposed to visit. So the great thing about the source is that it covers multiple dimensions. It's about the people who are looking to move and about the things that they carried, uh, but also about the time and space through which they traveled. So let's start from the people. Who is looking to move goods around in 15th century Italy, and especially who is looking to move goods across borders. So 
A first group which relied extensively on trade licenses is people working directly for the state. Uh, soldiers, for example, can be find, found applying for a license um, pretty much all the time. Uh, that's something that will allow them to replenish the stocks of grains, but also finding hay for the horses. And the same goes for castellans, the officials in charge of one of the many fortresses of the duchy. Uh, aside from soldiers and castellans, you also find the governors of entire provinces, such as the Venetian rectors of Brescia and Crema, two areas which, as you probably know, depended heavily on importing supplies from the Po Valley. Another notable individual, just to give you a sense of who comes up um, in this register, is the Marquis of Mantua. In 1454 alone, he applied for as many as five different licenses to move something like 200 carts worth of wine from his land in the Monferrato all the way through Lombardy and finally to his residence in uh, Mantua. And, but I mean, I guess, aside from special cases, the vast majority of people seeking a license to move goods across Lombardy were actually private individuals. So not statements, not officials. Many of them were simply uh, trying to make ends meet to provide for their families. And then if anything was left, retail any surplus uh, within their communities. But some were only granted a license so that they could transfer goods for other people. Uh, a good example is aristocratic families. Think uh, Torelli, Scotti, Borromeo. These are all families who were very unlikely to perform any journey themselves. So their agents, uh, which are referred to as Nunzi in the Liber, can be found applying for a license on their behalf. And the same can be said about the five men members of the clergy who I was able to find, find uh, in those licenses. Uh, they also secured a license that year. And uh, among them, there are also three prioresses, so the, the vast majority of women, if you want to think about it that way. And those three prioresses are also the only women featured in the fragment, which is very telling. And finally, next to noblemen and, and nuns, in this case, special deputies were also employed by um, communities in need. Um, such as those of the populous valleys of the Bergamasco. And think about a community like that of um, Camerata Cornello in Val Brembana, uh, uh, which Rachel mentioned earlier, or another valley, the, Val the Valla Verara, that Joanne mentioned as well. All of those valleys, uh, over there, the, the need for supplies was such that uh, many of the communities of these valleys appointed deputies at regular intervals. And that was their way to secure a constant flow of provisions from more fertile areas. And on that note, let me show you what this data looks like when uh, plotted on a map, since we've been talking about itineraries already. Um, so here you can see in red, the places from which products originated. And in blue, purple, who knows, I'm colorblind. I guess I, I selected blue, but who remembers now? Uh, so in blue, you find the destinations. And the size of each dot uh, reflects how many licenses mention the locality in question. So the larger the dot, the bigger the magnitude of movement coming from or going to that locality. Um, so red, origin, blue, bubble, destination. And I included a line in the middle uh, to mark the borders of the Duchy of Milan, um, which is handy, but also to separate it from its neighbors, especially to the east, the, the Republic of Venice, obviously, to the northeast, and the uh, Marquis of Mantua uh, to the southeast. So uh, what do we learn from, from this map? Well, the first thing is something that I'm sure all of you suspected already, um, which is that the economy of the region relied heavily on a constant transfer of resources from the fertile lowlands of the Po Valley to the large centers at the foothills of the Alps, from where we can imagine supplies moved even further into uh, the mountains. There's really no other way to account for the ridiculous amount of foodstuff that were moved to a place like uh, Bergamo, which as you can see in the map is, is the biggest recipient in the whole region. And uh, obviously we can't know about the last leg of 
the journey of these goods and people. Because once you're inside the Bergamasco, once you've reached Bergamo, you're free to move goods without paying any further duties within the confine of that district. And that's, that's pretty large, actually. It really means about 40,000 people across the whole pre-Alpine uh, region. The other thing we learn from looking at this map is that every day a considerable amount of resources left the Duchy of Milan for neighboring territories. And it did so with the complicity of the Duke himself, who was the guy ultimately releasing these um, licenses. And that I think says a lot about the challenges that the Dukes were facing, trying to allow their producers to make enough good business, but also making sure that there was enough product left to make everybody else just as happy. Finally, let's have a look at what happens when you connect all of those points of origins with their destinations. So now I think the importance of the corridor that I just talked about, linking the lowlands with the mountains is even more evident. And so is the transfer of resources from the Duchy of Milan to places located just across the state borders. You can see especially, uh, again, near the Bergamo, but also the Bresciano. And those are all places from which you can imagine products moved even further into the Ishan territory or the Bresciano and the Bergamasco, et cetera, and ultimately the mountains. But what I find most interesting about this um, visualization is that it also shows how things moved inside the duchy. So you can see connections, from inst for instance, from the Pavese around Pavia, all the way up to the Lake of Como, Lecco, um, and, and those areas, or, or for instance, around the Lodigiano, Lodi, um, going not so far away, but actually, actually, but you still need a license to read the Gerardada, which is know, only 10 miles away or something like that. And that confirms the preliminary conclusion that I mentioned sort of halfway through my paper, which is that no matter the new state borders of large polities like the Duchy of Milan, the systems and facilities established by the old city-states still mattered a great deal and shown, and shown by the fact that those itineraries uh, are on the map um, because they ultimately had to obtain a license and that's why they show up in the Libra albums in the first place. And that's also my first uh, conclusion, uh, which is that when thinking about infrastructures on mobility, it is important to keep in mind that a multifaceted regime of movement featured internal boundaries as much as external frontiers. So crossing borders, in other words, happened at all levels. And it wasn't just a matter of moving from one state to another, as you can imagine, as you can sort of figure when looking at sort of the 15th century map of the peninsula. My second conclusion is about change, as I promised at the beginning. So as we saw, the infrastructures and even patterns of exchange were still the same, much like they are today between Europe and the UK. So what's really new in the 15th century? Well, the answer has to be found in the changing bureaucracy of movement, and especially when reconsidering the nature of trade licenses. And that's because what these documents did for the Duke ultimately was allowing him to unlock or restrict when needed the circulation of goods across the entirety of uh, his dominion. And that effectively meant centralizing the politics of mobility uh, for the whole uh, region. And that's also where the new balance between movement and control was found in a system which brought power firmly to the center, but still retained much of the existing infrastructures in the peripheries. And on that note, I'll thank you all and uh, can't wait to hear your questions.